by our beloved son in Christ, Lincoln, and a beautiful piece of piano playing by our beloved son, Sargon. May God bless them and bless you all, uh, my beloveds, and bless every soul that does great work for the Lord Jesus to glorify his holy name through these wonderful deeds. Well, this evening it's a continuation with our journey with Christ. And today I believe it's the sixth stage uh, of journey with Christ and we are talking about the book of Genesis chapter 3, the Garden of Eden. Um, just a nutshell of an introduction so we can go into this and hopefully we can uh, finalize what we were going to finish last Friday and we only got stuck on the number one point. We said there were 10 points that took place in the Garden of Eden and uh, I was hoping that I could finish the 10 points but I only elaborated on the first point and that took about an hour and a half. So um, we hope we can finish the other nine in the next an hour and a half. <laughs> We're praying for that. Um, Last Friday, we were talking about the family. And we said the family was the first thing the Almighty God, Elohim, uh, uh, established on earth. Marriage was the first thing instituted by the Almighty God on earth. And through marriage, the Lord, uh, the Almighty God wanted a family. And we said that God himself is family. And a family to God is the number one priority because out of family the church is established out of family society race everything comes out of, out of the family and this family is uh, comes together through marriage between a man and a woman Adam and Eve so um, we uh, talked about this for, for, uh, for, in, for quite a lengthy talk last Friday, and we went into details. I just want to mention something, and I'll go on to the other nine points this evening, and that is family is built on love. The, the Almighty God created everything and everyone based on true divine love. For love to exist, it requires two and more persons for, for love to come into existence love cannot exist with only one unit that is why when some people say to the Christian uh, believers that you believe in more than one God we say that is not true because the Holy Bible is very clear that God is as one or Israel your God is one. Remember this. It is written absolutely in total clarity in the Holy Bible that God is one. However, this one God cannot be just one unit. He, uh, he cannot be just one unit. He is one in three and three in one at the same time. But when we say three persons in the in the nature of God, we are not claiming that God is three, like three gods. Far from that. God is one, but this one cannot be just one. It is one in three and three in one. When we come to the human being, since God created us in his image according to his likeness, we see that we are not just one, we are one in three and three in one. In the epistle of St. Paul to the Th Th uh, Thessalonians, Th Thessalonians 1, chapter 5, verse 23, or 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, St. Paul very clearly says that a human being is made out of body, soul, and spirit. Made out of body, soul, and spirit. So this human being is one, but is he really one in the sense of just one unit? No, he is made out of body, soul, and spirit. At the same time, we exist, that's one, we have an intellect, that's two, and we have a life, that's three. But does that make us three people? No, we are one, but this one is not just one. I have an existence, I have a brain, and I have a life. 
my existence is not my brain and neither my brain is my existence or, nor my life each one is unique but the three make one human being I'm not three I am one in three and three in one if we ask anyone who believes in the true divine God and the Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, everything that is visible and invisible, do you believe that God exists? They're going to say yes. Otherwise, where did this existence come from if God did not exist you know, prior to that? So God exists, they'll say yes. Do you believe God has a brain? He is wise, he is intelligent. They're going to say yes. Otherwise, how did this complex and intelligent universe come about if there was not a brain behind all this in intelligent universe and complex universe? So God is wise. Do you believe God is the living God? Of course, they're going to say yes. Otherwise, where did life come from? And when we read in the book of Genesis, it says that the Lord God breathed into the nostrils of Adam the breath of life and Adam became a living soul. So the breath of life came from God. God is the source of life. He is the living God and he is the life giver. So now God exists. God is intelligent, has a brain and God is the living God. But it is one God but this one God cannot be just one unit. It is one in three and three in one. The existence of God is the Father. The brain of God is the Son, S-O-N. And the life of God is the Holy Spirit. God is holy and God is spirit in his nature. So the, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is the source of life. The intelligence of God, the brain of God, is the Son. And the existence of God is the Father. The word Father in the Hebrew or Aramaic language Syriac is Abon or Awon, depending on the pronunciation or on the accent of the language. So the pronunciation is Abon or Awon. Now Abon or Awon literally means the foundation to all foundations, the root to all roots, and the essence of all essence. So when we say, when we say the Lord's Prayer, our Father, the word Father in Aramaic is Abon or Awon, meaning the source to every source, the foundation to every foundation, the existence to every existence. That's what the word Father means. So, God is Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but one God. Father and Son and the relationship between the Father and Son, the bond between the Father and the Son is through the Holy Spirit. And that is why love is made possible to exist because love cannot exist with one unit. If I'm just one, I, one cannot love itself. Love can only come into existence when there is someone else with me. In a relationship, love, be, love comes into existence when I get to know another person. The moment I get to know another person, I, be, be, I begin to love that person. But the reason why I can love myself as well, because I am not just one, I am three in one. I exist, I have a brain, and I have a life. I have a body, I have a soul, and I have a spirit. These three make one human being. But because there is more than one inside of this being, therefore I am able to love myself, and then when, some, when another person comes in my life, I'm able to love that person. Unless there is two and more love cannot exist period so when we claim that God is only one and one only well one can't love itself there has to be someone else I'll leave that for another topic because it's very deep that's to do with the gospel of John chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning was the word 
Now the word in the Greek language is logos. Logos means intellect, brain. In the beginning was the brain, and the brain was with God, and the brain was God. And that'll be another topic for a later stage. Now, love can only exist where there is two or more. Family begins with male and female, husband and wife, Adam and Eve. When the two came together, love came and existed between the two. And the love was the bond between these two. When they came together, they produced children, family, came into existence based on love where there is two people and more. Now you see in Adam and Eve, love made that family come into existence. A marriage through marriage family was brought to, into existence. There are three kinds of churches. There is what we call the personal church, there is what we call the family church, and there is what we call the universal church. The personal church is me. I am that personal church. I, I myself am a church of Christ. The family, husband and wife, father and mother and children, this family is also another church. And there is the universal church, meaning the one we go to on Sundays usually, where we receive the body and the blood of Christ from the holy altar. And I pray that day is very, 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 very soon, where all of our beloveds come back to the church and praise the Lord one more time and receive him in the truth, in the body and the blood of Christ in the truth. Now, in these three churches, they are all made out of three. Because the one who created us is Trinity, is three in one and one in three. So he created everything in three. I am made out of three. I am body, soul, and spirit. Three in one and one in three. The family church. There is the father, there is the mother, and there is the children, three, trinity. And the universal church is also made out of three. There is the priest, there is the deacon, and there is the congregation, three. And do you notice one thing? Unless the three come together, there is no love, and if there is no love, there is no life. So when the three get together, there is love, and through love, there is life. So I am body, soul, and spirit, together in one. This came because of love, and through love, I am living. The family, father, mother, and children got together, based, built on love, there is life. And the universal church, when the priest comes, and the deacons, and the congregations, it is a complete, perfect picture of the true church of Christ. Then there is life. The body and the blood of Christ is giving to the faithful, to all, the priest, the deacon, and the congregation for the remission of sins, i.e., to gain eternal life. I need to move on. The number one thing that happened in the Garden of Eden was the enemy put suspicion in the mind and the heart of our mother Eve. And through suspicion, we said it killed faith, and by killing faith, fear entered the human race. And we're still experiencing that till this very day. Number two. The woman said, God has said you shall not eat, nor shall you touch it. You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Genesis 3, 2. When, when the serpent came and whispered into the ear of our mother Eve, said, did really God say, you know, you can't eat from all the trees? Which obviously God did not say. God only said, from one tree you cannot eat, and that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But look at Eve, what she said to, to the serpent. She said, no, the Lord God said, 
you cannot, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it. The Lord God did not mention touching. He only said to Adam, don't eat from the tree. He did not say to Adam, don't touch the tree. But you see what happens, because our mother Eve was walking alone, meaning she kept her distance from God. Every time we walk away from God and we go alone on our own journey away from God, what do we do? We begin to add and subtract to the word of God. We begin to change things. We begin to falsify the truth because the only way I can preserve that truth when I am connected and bonded to Jesus Christ. The moment I walk alone away from Christ, I begin to add and subtract from his word. So Mother Eve, she said to the serpent, yeah, the Lord God said, don't eat from it and don't touch it. Oh, Eve, you've just added to the word of God. And look, when we read in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 6, Proverbs 36, what does it say? Do not add to his words, meaning to God. Do not add to his words, or he will reprove you, and you will be proved a liar. If we add to God's word, he will prove that we are lying. So when our mother Eve added to the word of God, by saying, and God also said, do not touch the tree, she added to the word of God, I was seen in the eyes of God as a liar. And that's why our mother Eve fell and through her, Adam also fell and the entire human race. Do not lie. One of the Ten Commandments. Do not lie. Now, Satan brings suspicion. We add it to the word of God by keeping our distance from him. Number three, the enemy. We see in Genesis 3, 5, for God knows, look at the enemy, how, he, how deceptive he is. Genesis 3, 5. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What the enemy, the serpent, Satan, what he was trying to deceive the human race with, he was trying to say that, look, God is very selfish God. He is depicting a very ugly picture of God uh, in, to our imagination and our thoughts. The enemy always wants to reveal God to us as the judging one, as the harsh one, as the selfish one, as someone that, does not, that wants to enslave us. He always depicts a very false picture of the true divine God. He wants us to go against him. That is his job. So he said, you know why Eve, he said, don't eat from this tree? He is a selfish God. He doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to be like God, knowing good and evil. He always wants you under his control. He is a selfish God. But look at God prior to Genesis chapter three, when we read in Genesis chapter one, the very beginning, Chapter 1, verse 26, look what God has said. Then God said, let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, let us, Trinity, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. What was the intention of Elohim? What was the intention of the Almighty God from the very beginning prior to creating us? His intention was to create this man like him. So that was the very intention of God from the very beginning. He wanted to create Adam and make Adam like him. But look at Satan. 
You see, God said to you, don't eat from that tree because he doesn't want you to be like him. But God had said it from the very start. Look how the enemy enters our thoughts through deception. He's a snake, very sneaky. When, when Eve ate, our mother Eve ate, and gave to Adam to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the moment Adam ate, what happened? They lost their innocence. They lost their innocence. They saw themselves naked. I mean, they were always naked beforehand, but they didn't realize what nakedness is. They were not ashamed or embarrassed of being naked before the fall. After they ate and brought God's word, their eyes opened and they saw themselves naked and they got embarrassed and ashamed and they hid behind the tree. Well, Adam and Eve, you were always naked beforehand. How come you were not embarrassed? Because we were innocent. A little baby, a child, a little baby, you make that baby stand fully naked in front of a thousand people. And those people are laughing and enjoying themselves and this baby is fully naked. And you see the baby laughing, jumping, and uh, uh, you know, for joy, big smile on the baby's face. The baby is not ashamed, is not embarrassed before a thousand people being fully naked. Why isn't the baby embarrassed or ashamed? Because the baby is still holding that innocence. The moment the baby grows older and becomes mature, we become embarrassed to reveal our nakedness even to our own mother and our own dad. Yet, they used to bath us. They used to change us all the time, but now I'm embarrassed. Please, mom, don't come in, I'm naked. Dad, don't come in, I'm naked. Why? Because as we grew older, we lost our innocence. We lost our innocence. And I'll need to elaborate on this for a moment. When you read in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 10, verse 16, the Lord Jesus is talking here. He said to his 12 disciples, he said, I am sending you like sheep in the midst of wolves. I am sending you like sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wise as a serpent and be innocent as a dove. Be wise as a serpent and be innocent as a dove. Wow. Adam and Eve, when they ate from the forbidden tree, they lost their innocence. They were embarrassed. They saw themselves naked. They were embarrassed. They hid themselves from God. The Lord, in the Gospel of Matthew, the New Testament, he said, I'm sending you like sheep to the disciples. I'm sending you like sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove. Now, someone would wonder, what does the word innocence mean here? What does the Lord mean, be innocent as a dove? Innocence, my beloved, it doesn't mean that I am simple, I am humble, I am like a little baby, I don't know any better. No, I don't know any better, it's called ignorance. The Lord Jesus does not want you to be ignorant like the intellectual capacity of a little child, but he wants you to be innocent like a child. And that's why the Lord said, unless you come back and be like a little kid, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. To come back as a kid, he's talking about innocence, not wisdom. No, no, you need to be wise as a serpent, not ignorant. You need to be wise as a servant, but you need to be innocent as a dove. Now, why a dove relates to innocence? Out of the entire, entire birds of the sky, out of the entire birds of the sky, when any bird comes and builds a nest and begin to establish a family as well, they lay their eggs, 
the moment that bird just feels there is a danger approaching, not, not seeing, feeling there is a danger approaching, the first thing that bird does, takes that nest and moves it elsewhere. They change their spot. The only bird of the sky that never changes the nest is the dove. The dove builds a nest, lays the eggs, have babies. The dove goes flying, searching for food to come and feed those babies. As the, as the dove goes searching for food, the enemy comes, an eagle or a snake climb up the tree, an eagle comes from above and they devour that nest. They eat some of those babies, kill some of those babies and leave them in the nest. The mother dove comes back with food to feed her children. When she sees the, some of the babies are missing gone, some of them dead in the nest, the only bird out of the sky, that dove sits in that nest, mourns, mourns for the loss of the babies and those who were killed and those who got lost. The dove cries like a human being, my beloveds. The dove cries like a human being, mourning for the loss of her, of her babies. But one thing the dove never does, the dove never changes the location of the nest. The dove brings, lays eggs again and remains there till death remains there. When the Lord Jesus said to the apostles, I'm sending you like sheep in the midst of wolves. I want you to be wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove. Meaning, when a sheep goes into the wolf, the wolf will devour you. The wolf will persecute you. You are going to be persecuted for my name's sake. Some of you will be killed. Some of you will be thrown in prison. Some of you will be kicked punched, let, you know, whipped and thrown out. You will be ridiculed for my name. I want you to be standing steadfast in my way. Don't ever change your nest and go to another path. Christ has placed you in his path. No matter what persecutions come your way, I want you to be faithful and loyal to your Christ. Remain in the path and in the way of Christ. Be like the dove, innocent meaning, never changing your path because of tribulations, persecutions, and, and being killed for the name of Christ. Learn from the dove. Stay where you are, steadfast, firm in the Lord. Don't change your path. This is innocence. Wow. Looks like I'm not gonna finish the 10 points. I have to elaborate so you understand why the Lord Jesus said, wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove. The Lord speaks of duetto, dual language. He says in the Gospel of Matthew chapter five, you are the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth too. About the Lord himself, he is the Lamb of God and he is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the Lamb and he is the Lion too. Now, they are two parallel lines, never meet. Two parallel lines never meet. For every orthodoxy is paradoxy. Paradoxy, they are paradoxical lines. Two parallel lines never meet. It doesn't make sense. God brings out of the grave life. God brings out of death life. They are two parallel lines. They will never meet. Life is life and death is death. Death will never be life. Life will never be death. Life cannot die and death cannot live. But God said, out of death I'll bring life. For this is God. What is impossible to man is possible to God. I bring out of the two parallel lines my mightiness. I am the lamb and I am the lion. Two parallel lines don't meet. The lamb so weak, the lion so powerful. So 
salt and light. Light comes from heaven, salt comes from the ocean, from below, light from above, salt from below, two different, two parallel lines, never meet. Wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove, two parallel lines. But these two parallel lines are amazing when you have them together. Body and spirit, body and spirit. And by the way, salt um, is, is made out of two substances. And these two substances, when you take them on their own separately, they can be very fatal, they are poison. Um, sodium and chlor chlorine or chlorine chlor and sodium sodium is poisonous and chlorine is poisonous on its own but when you mix them together sodium and chlor become salt and when you put salt in your food wow food without salt they are tasteless no matter how beautiful they are, but they have no taste. What brings flavor to that food is the salt. But the salt is made out of two poisonous substances if you take them separately. But the two together gives you flavor, taste, and nourishment, and life. The body and the spirit, two different substances. Body on its own, fatal. Spirit on, her, on its own is very poisonous and, and it's very fatal. But when the body and the spirit are together, when you bring Jesus into the equation, he'll make sure that the, that the level or the measure of chlor and the measure of sodium is perfect measures so that that way it is not poison to kill you. The Lord will make sure the measures of the chlor and sodium are perfect measures. It is the only one, it is the Lord Jesus who brings the body and the spirit into harmony and make these two different um, substances, he brings them into unity and make them live together in unity. It is Christ who gives the perfect measure to the body and the spirit to make him live in harmony and absolute perfect union. Wise as a serpent. Now what is a serpent? We've been talking about the serpent. The serpent is the enemy. Satan came into the serpent. The serpent is the enemy. But the Lord actually commended the enemy for, for, for the wisdom that, that the enemy has. He said, learn from the enemy. He's very wise. The snake, my beloved, when it encounters an enemy, the snake realizes, when, it, when the snake realizes that it cannot win the battle with this enemy, so if it engages in a fight with the enemy, the enemy is stronger than the snake, the snake does one thing. It actually hides its head and, and rotates the body on top of that head. When the enemy comes and devours the body of the snake, rips into it, cuts it to pieces, that is fine. The snake never dies until the head is crushed. You can cut the snake in half. As long as the head is not crushed, the, the body of the snake will regrow again and will live, the snake will not die. The only time the snake is dead, when you crush the head. So the snake covers the head with the body and it says, very wise, it says, let the enemy eat my body, the body will grow again. When the enemy eats the body and sees that it's shredded to pieces, the enemy thinks I'm dead, the enemy goes, after a little while my body will regrow again and I will live, I, I overcame the enemy with wisdom. The Lord Jesus says, you are sheep being sent by me in the midst of wolves. Protect your head. What does it mean protect your head like the snake? The Lord says, the word I have bestowed I have given you, bestowed upon you, the word that, I, that you heard through your ease. I want my word to remain in your head. Don't ever let no one to brainwash you and take you away from the truth. Protect your head like the snake. What you heard from your Jesus, 
Hold on to it. Don't let any false teachings to come and brainwash you and take the true word from your head and with it take your soul, spirit and body into perdition. What I gave you, my disciples, is the truth. Protect your head from the enemy. Don't let the enemy deceive you and brainwash you. Be wise as a serpent. Protect your head. Be innocent as a dove. Remain faithful in my way. Don't veer off the road when you are persecuted. Don't veer off the road when you are having it tough. Don't veer off the road because you are, being, you are going through tri tribulation for the Lord's sake. No matter how much they persecute you for my sake, remain faithful to me like a, like a dove. Be innocent. Remain in your path. Innocence on its own is ignorance. Wisdom on its own is evilness. But the Lord put it together. Be wise as a serpent. Be innocent as a dove. Together. Not one on its own. No. Innocence only, ignorance. Wisdom only, evil. Satan, that is why he is called the evil one. Please pay attention. The Holy Bible refers to us as sinners, not evil. <laughs> Who is the evil one? Satan. Why? Because Satan was given wisdom, but that wisdom... He lost it because he wanted to be like God. He wanted to be another God in heaven. So wisdom alone becomes evil. He lost innocence. That's why he made Eve and Adam lose their innocence. Because he lost it. He was once upon a time in heaven as an innocent angel. The moment he broke God's word, he lost that innocence. He, he did not lose his wisdom, but he lost his innocence as a dove. So he, he only ended up with wisdom. Wisdom alone is evil. So now Satan uses his wisdom for evil things because he doesn't have innocence anymore. Innocence only, ignorance. But when the Lord Jesus gave us innocence and wisdom together, it is the power of God. What is the power of God? The Holy Cross. <laughs> the Holy Cross crushed the head of the serpent. Jesus, the perfect man, whatever his Father in heaven gave him Jesus protected his head. He was tempted by the tempter, but Jesus never failed because whatever his daddy instilled in his head, that head was protected by the Lord. His body was shredded on the cross, but he preserved the head. For as long as the head is preserved, preserved the body will, will, will resurrect. You can crush this body. I'll be given the glorified body, Satan. I have crushed your head. You crushed my body, but I crushed your head. For as long as the head is protected, the body can grow again. But once the head is gone, even if the body is intact, it will be dead. What gives life to the body is the head. The moment the head is gone, the body is gone automatically. So the Lord Jesus on the cross is innocence as the dove and wisdom as a serpent at the same time. This is the power of God, the Holy Cross. Jesus, he remained loyal to his daddy. He remained faithful to his daddy. He came to do the will of his daddy and he did it till the end, the death of the cross. He never veered off the road no matter what came his way. That is the innocence of the dove. And whatever came his way was put to shame because he protected his head. He never let nothing and no one to brainwash him and take the word of God from his head. He was wise like a serpent, protected his faith, protected his mission till the very end. This is the power of God. 
Christ hanged on the cross, innocence and wisdom at the same time. But when we lose our innocence, we have lost the way of Christ. We have veered off from the way of Christ because innocence is the dove and the dove remains in the path, never changes the path. My goodness. Point number three, the enemy said, you're gonna be like God, don't worry, eat from the tree. God said, I've already made you like me before I created you in Genesis 1.26. That, that was the only reason why I came to create you, to make you like me. We forgot. We forgot what God has said. Number five, the man. What did they do? They sowed thick leaves and made for themselves coverings. Genesis 3.7. When Adam and Eve saw themselves there naked, they got embarrassed. So what, to cover themselves, they took the leaves of a fig tree. Because normally, the leaves of a fig tree, they're very big. Other trees, their leaves are, are very small, but, but the fig tree leaves are fairly big. So they made out of the fig leaves covering to cover their nakedness. Obviously, whatever we do to cover our own mistakes, eventually it's not gonna work because the genius Adam and Eve thought that they can fix their problems by their own way. So they decided to cover themselves with fig leaves, but the leaf is gonna wither, it's gonna dry, and it's gonna fall apart, and your nakedness will resurface once again. This is the dilemma of the human race till this very day. We are trying to fix our mistakes. We are trying to fix our errors with our own ways, not God's. Please give up. Stop fixing your issues by yourself. Stop saying, I can do it, I can fix it. You cannot. The more you try, the more you're gonna make it worse on yourself. The more you're gonna cause damage for yourself because whatever way you do to fix your errors, you will fail and the leaf will fall and you'll be seen naked, i.e. you'll be ashamed and embarrassed before the whole world and above all before your God. Let God cover your nakedness. Let God wash away your sins. Let God fix your problems. Come to him as you are naked. Don't hide from God. Some people say, I'll go to church when I'm ready. That is a deceptive statement by Satan. Because neither me nor you, my beloved, will ever be ready to go to church. We are never ready to go to God. It is only God who can make us ready when we just ask for his help. If we say, when I'll go to church when I'm ready, that day will never come. Go to Christ your God as you are with your filth with your nakedness, with your sins, with your errors, with your mishaps, with your shortfalls. Go to him as you are. Stop trying to fix it yourself. You cannot. It is only through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we are made ready to face God. It is only through Christ what he had done on Calvary made us ready to face God when we accept the Lamb of God as Savior and Redeemer for our lives, then Jesus will make us ready to be in the presence of the Almighty God. Outside of that, forget it. You can never be ready, never. Now in Genesis 3, 7, men covered themselves with the fig leaves, brilliant, Genius people, my goodness. And isn't it the same case what is happening in our time and age? 
Look at the world. The world is trying to cover itself by itself. And the more they try to fix it their way, the more embarrassment they are bringing upon themselves. And they are putting themselves to shame. What is happening on a global level with this so-called pandemic is absolute childish behavior from governments. Childish behavior. God bless.